do you get your deals from a distressed properties or how do you find your deals yeah the best deal i mean the best deals i get and, and people always think it's funny but it's truly word of mouth like just building relationships so we started that's great like you directly jump into real estate right when you came back can you tell us more about the seller financing I want to go back to that scenario where if a bank is involved and the seller wants the money and we do not have the money and we really like this problem. But I said keep asking me. She never emailed me. I gave her my email. Never emailed me. I said email me every month. But I said this to someone else. You know, I have a guy that emails me every single month asking me if I have a property to sell. And best book. Blog or podcast to recommend? Oh gosh, um, I mean, Rich Dad Poor Dad for sure. You know, change, you know, it, it, huge impact on my life. A lot of the books in in that in that series have been very impactful, especially early on. Um, gosh, the Compound Effect is been is a great book. Hello, namaste. Thank you for tuning into Quantum Investing Channel. This is your host, Sarat Chalam Charla. In this video, we're going to talk to a guest. Before I introduce him, I would ask you to smash that like button, share my video, and also subscribe to my channel. This is important for this YouTube algorithm to bring my videos up. The guest we're going to talk to, he is a great example to learn from how to get into real estate without any money down. Right from high school, he was into army, he was deployed to Middle East, and then came back, he doesn't know what to do. Best thing he got into is real estate without any money from his pocket. How he has done is through seller financing. From 2002, now he made that into big empire with 175 units. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gabriel Hamel. Hello, Gabriel. How are you doing? Doing great. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for coming on to the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Can you tell us yourself, like, you know, how you got into real estate? Where did you start and how did you start? Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes back a while, like pre, even pre real estate, I, I knew and I was attracted to business. I just didn't know what that was going to look like. So at a young age, you know, coming out of high school, I didn't really have a lot of direction. I had actually joined the Army National Guard while in high school. And a couple of years after high school, you know, doing a, some odd and end jobs and different things, I, I read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I know that book's had a big impact on a lot of people's, a lot of people's lives, you know, and that was the first book really that just opened my eyes to this, this other way. Everyone, you know, kind of pushes this go to school, go to more school, go to college, get a job. Um, and, and really, even, even though my parents weren't college educated, that was kind of the default answer was, hey, maybe you should go to college and, and get a job. And I, I pick up this book and I'm like, wow, I want to I build financial freedom. I'm going to do that through real estate. And so that was really the beginning, you know, kind of the, the inspiration of, of real estate. And that was 02. And then in 2003, I got deployed to Iraq um, with, with the Army National Guard. And, and I was there overseas, over in the Middle East for about a year. Um, then I came back and I bought my first house in, in 2005. That's how you started. That's great. Like you directly jump into real estate, right? When you came yeah. back. Yeah. So like 2004, it was a hot market. I was, I found a realtor. I was looking at properties. I was making offers. The crazy part is, you know, 2004, I went to a lender with, I had no job. I had no income, uh, no down payment. The, the lenders approved me for a loan. It was a no money down loan. And after making a lot of offers, finally by 2005, I think it was about May of 2005, March, April, May, some, somewhere around there, 2005, I bought my first house and it was, uh, you know, I, I house hacked it. I, I didn't know the term then, but I rented out two of the bedrooms and I lived for less than I could anywhere else. You know, I did the same thing in 06 and similar thing in 07. And then it really changed um, by the time 2008 rolled around. Uh, I had also opened up a small nutrition store in 06. And then by 2008, the store wasn't making money. My first son was born. And in 2008, uh, I went back to the bank and said, hey, I want to buy another house. And, and they said, well, too bad. Guidelines have changed you actually need a job and an income and a down payment, none of which I, none of which I had. Um, and that's when I really found seller financing. And that's when I really dove into realizing the advantages of seller financing, not only for me as a buyer, but also for the sellers. And that's, 
that's when I got real serious about starting to build my portfolio. Can you tell us more about the seller financing? Yeah. So most people are, um, have an understanding of, of real estate in the sense of, you know, you either pay cash for a property or you go to the bank and get a, and get a bank loan. You need to have a money, um, right? That's a general, right? Thing. Yep. Exactly. You either have the money to do it or you, you put some money down and you're, you're subject to whatever the bank tells you. You have to qualify. Uh, you know, this is the down payment. This is the interest rate. The bank kind of tells you, Hey, here's, here's the terms with, with seller financing. The sellers are the ones that are carrying the finance and they are the bank. So rather than making uh, a mortgage payment to the bank, you're making a more mortgage payment to the seller. You take title, you own the property, just like you would own the property. Uh, if you got a bank loan and you're just making your monthly payments, to those sellers. Um, you know, the, the big advantage on, on the buying side is the terms are just extremely negotiable. So rather than the bank telling you, here's the down payment, here's the interest rate, here's what you got to qualify, you and the seller get to decide that. And then there's a lot of advantages to the seller. You know, if you, if you pay cash for a home, they're pay and they get paid off, they're paying a capital gain on all at once. So with seller financing, you spread that payment out over, you know, say 30 years, however, how long, they're not paying that capital gain all at once. And for, for the seller, it also creates this new level of passivity. They're getting, they're getting income without having to go reinvest the money, without having to go put the money in the stock market and without have, having to actively invest or be a landlord anymore. So it's a true, true win-win. What kind of uh, the seller financing, are the sellers uh, going to be on the first position note or uh, if the bank is involved, right? How does it work? Yeah. So in most cases with seller financing, banks not involved at all. So early on, like 2009 through 2013, all those deals, they were properties that had been owned free and clear. And the seller took a first lien position on the property. And I made my payments directly to the, directly to the sellers. Um, I had had a, have had a few cases where the sellers actually took the lien off the property and the note became, and that was because I was in a position to refinance. They wanted, they still wanted that income and they didn't want to be paid off. And we had a good enough relationship that they were okay pulling the lien from the property. So again, it's, you know, a bank would never do that, but it's, it's really as flexible and, and um, as creative as you and the seller can get. Sellers still do the seller financing if they have mortgage running with the bank? Yeah, it's a good question. So they can, it's a little bit different. So if, if they don't have an existing loan on the property, uh, it's, pretty simple note and trust deed. You take title. Um, if there is existing financing on the property, the seller has existing financing, then you typically do what's called a subject to or a land sale contract. With a land sale contract, it's still recording with the county You're and they can't sell to anybody else. What it doesn't do is it doesn't trigger the due on sales clause. And essentially you'd be making, in, in those cases, what, the way I set it up, I'm making my payments directly to the to an escrow account, escrow accounts paying whatever existing uh, lien is on the property and then paying the seller, seller the difference. It's a way to control the property, own the property um, if, there's, if there's existing financing in place. So what are the advantages to the sellers doing this other than getting the monthly checks? Does it make any difference in the capital gains, the tax uh, cut and everything or getting lump sum and dividing and all? Is there something you yeah. can share there? Yeah, it does. There's a lot of different reasons um, that sellers want to carry financing. Sometimes it's they just want that, that passive income. Um, in, in most cases, the sellers that have carried financing for me, and not all cases, but most cases, the sellers have self-managed. And so they're looking for a new level of passivity, but they want that income. So a lot of times these sellers are in their 60s and 70s. They've been landlord. They've been maintenance person. They're doing the repairs. They're they're really handling everything, very hands on, and they're just burnt out. And that also creates a scenario where the properties are poorly managed, under rented, deferred maintenance. And so there's upside upside for you as an owner. And so a lot a lot of times these sellers they don't want to be paid that lump sum because they don't want to pay that huge capital gain. They don't want to do a 1031 exchange because they don't want to actively invest. They're not in the market like they they were previously. They're 60, 70. They, a lot of times these yeah, a lot of times these sellers, they have another job or another business they're running and the, the real estate, even though it's built some level of wealth for them, it's become a little bit of a headache. And so they don't want to go actively invest. They don't want to take that lump sum, pay capital gain and then go stick it in the stock market because, you know, who knows what the stock market's going to do. They want income. And in a lot of cases, they want income for the rest of their life. And so you're able to create a scenario where, you know, you take an asset that they've, that they've owned for several years and they're earning interest on that 
you know, on that asset. So whatever terms you agree on, you're paying them, they're earning interest. You're happy as the buyer, they're happy as the seller. Uh, I mean, just a, a, a true win-win and, and different sellers want different things. Um, you know, some sellers are stuck on price, some interest rate, some down payment, you know, early on, a lot of these deals were shorter term, there would be balloon payments. And I share the story a lot because I kind of thought these were the typical terms, right? Like interest rate slightly above market interest rate, interest only a balloon in, you know, two to five years. And then I had a seller, this couple in their mid or mid late seventies carry for 30 years. That made me kind of re, really rethink it because those sellers, what they wanted, they wanted income for the rest of their life and they wanted their adult children when they passed away to continue to get that payment without just having the, the property itself. They wanted to give their children the paper yes. asset of the note so that, that income continued. And it made me realize, I don't know what sellers want unless I ask them. Uh, that's a great segue, I would, I would believe. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I want to go back to that scenario where if a bank is involved, and, sure. and the seller wants the money and we do not have the money and we really like this property, right? And in that case, so does the bank go in the first position note and seller goes to second? Uh, you, you can do that. I've never done that. I've never used, other than my first three properties, which was during the subprime, no doc type loans, 05, 06, 07. I've never, I've never bought a property with traditional financing oh. and I've never ever. So from, and, and I've never used where I've done partially seller financing and partially bank financing. I have seen that. I, I have friends and acquaintances that have done that where the seller will take a second position. Um, and rarely will a bank take a second position behind a first position unless maybe it's hard money and maybe the seller's carrying like a, a, a much larger portion of the loan. But in most cases, if a bank's involved, the bank's going to probably want to take a first position on it. How is your portfolio divided in the real estate? I know you started with a single family and like, you know, multifamily and now you're into mobile homes and all that, right? How is it divided currently? Yeah, it's, it's a mix. I, I only have a handful of single families. I'm actually selling off my, uh, my single, not all my single families, but I'm selling off a, a portion of my single families. I'm selling, um, you know, some of the original properties that I purchased just because they're lower cash flow, higher equity, uh, which is important. You know, something I, something I explain a lot is, the cash flow of those first properties is what carried me to be in a position today to be able to sell those. I didn't rely on that equity position. I wasn't banking on the equity position. They're my lower cash flow in properties. They started off only a couple hundred dollars a month of cash flow, but it's why I'm able to sell it today. Because if they were cash flow negative, I probably wouldn't have held them this long. Um, so I still have some single family. Most of my portfolio um, is small, medium sized multifamily, some mixed use stuff where it's commercial ground floor, residential up. Uh, upstairs. And then I have a couple mobile home parks as well. And I'll combine about 175 units. And then I'm in, in works on a few other deals currently. That's nice. So do you get your deals uh, from a distressed properties or how do you find your deals? Yeah, the best deal, I mean, the best deals I get, and, and people always think it's funny, but it's truly word of mouth, like just building relationships. And, you know, I don't, I've never bought lists. I've never, uh, you know, sent out mailers, anything like that. It's really been just genuine organic networking, telling people what I'm looking for. And that can be with, with agents and brokers. And it can also just be with, with people in your community. Um, you know, going back to that first house I bought 2005, it was a hot market. And the home I ended up buying was a friend of the realtor's son. He bought the home at auction, was fixing it up. I'm standing in this thing after getting beat out by all these other buyers. And I'm sitting here going, nobody knows it's for sale. I'm the only one right now that knows it's for sale. And this is because of the real estate agent who had a relationship with that, with that seller. And I was still at a hot market able to buy that below market. So when I owned one home, I went and made business cards and I started telling everybody, like I knew nobody with money. I knew nobody in real estate. I knew no, I mean, and but I made business cards and I gave a card out to a guy at the gym that I was working out with and said, Hey, do you know anybody, you know, looking to sell their home? That second house was a friend of the, well, let me, let me say this. The friend that I gave the card to, it was his friend's dad. And I bought that 40,000 below market in a hot market just because I opened my mouth and said, here's what I'm looking for. That's and good. I quickly started realizing just the, the power of opening your mouth and telling people what you're looking for. There's other ways people are, people have been successful with, uh, you know, doing mass mailing and all that. I get those all the time. I throw them away or I recycle <laughs> them. Um, you know, every once in a while I see a name that I recognize and I'm like, great, I still recycle it. You know, so the best success, especially with the off market stuff is just, just building relationships and telling people what you're looking for. 
what kind of due diligence you do by looking into a property? Yeah, it, it depends on the property. Um, it's whether, whether or not I choose to have a formal inspection or not. Um, and it's, you know, it's different periods of time. There was a period of time where I was buying a lot of bank, bank owned properties. I was making cash offers. Sometimes it was cat. I was actually using my own cash. Sometimes it was hard money, private money. Um, you know, on those deals, I never got, I never got inspections. You know, I was buying these so below, uh, market value and they were so beat up. I didn't need a list of everything that was wrong. I already knew the whole, the whole house was wrong. Um, you know, I needed to work. So it just, it just depends on the deal. I don't usually do formal inspections. Um, you know, if it's a larger multifamily and there's some, some unknowns, I may, I may have some inspections there, but I can usually walk into a property, uh, you know, and, and have a good idea within a couple minutes of, you know, if, if the value or, or what to offer. Um, and same with analyzing, you know, a lot of people say like, how do you analyze deals? You just got to do it enough times. I mean, I'll, you know, nowadays I'll analyze a deal way before I go physically look at it early on. I'd go look at all these properties and I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. I'm just looking at every kind of property and, and, Part of that was good for building that network and, and meeting people. But I, I have to know on paper that it's gonna, that it's gonna pencil. Like I wanna look at the numbers first. If I like the numbers on a multifamily, I like the numbers, then I'm gonna get in contract and go look at it or go look at it you know, once I'm happy with the numbers. Because if the numbers don't make sense, I don't care what the property look, you know, looks like. There's a lot of beautiful properties out there that, that doesn't necessarily make it a good investment. And uh, are you into mobile homes or apartments? Or are you doing both? Yeah, most most of my stuff's multifamily, but I do have two mobile home parks, and um, I like and I and I would buy more mobile home parks. I, I plan to. I like the mobile home park space. They operate a lot like multifamily. You know, there's a lot of value add opportunity with uh, mobile home parks that are under rented. They're not building back utilities, uh, and and as a whole, uh, you know, the multifamily space, the, the returns are just getting condensed down to nothing. People are people are paying a lot more for uh, a lot less return, and I'm just not willing to willing to do that uh the property management and all you give it to the third party or you do it yourself third party property management yep uh what are the challenges you see with the renters with the mobile homes like you know you have a lot of units right what are the main challenges you see yeah specific to the mobile home park space or just in general specific to the mobile home parks you know there hasn't been as many you know, really any issue. So I don't, I don't have on-site managers at either park. I originally thought I would need an on-site manager. Um, but what I found is the people that live in the mobile home parks, that's their home. That's their community. You know, it might be on the lower end of the, you know, economic, uh, you know, housing, lower income housing, but these people, these people that live there, that's still their home. That's still their community. They care about where they live. They care about, you know, their neighbors and taking care of the place and looking out, looking out for each other. And so there really hasn't been, you know, been any issues. If there, if there's an issue, they're calling the property manager and it's usually just something minor that has to be, you know, worked out. And of, of course, occasionally, just like any property, um, you know, you can get an occasional bad tenant, but um, for the most part, it's been the, the mobile home, the mobile home park community. It's been pretty smooth. Uh, do you own both the houses and the land too, or you rent the land and they own the house? How- that's, a, that's a good question. I don't want to own any of the mobile homes but I do. So both the parks that I purchased, one's a 43 unit, one's a 38 unit, both the parks had uh, stick built structures. So one of the parks had an eight, like uh, eight studio units. Um, and I guess actually another studio. So nine. And then the other park had like a duplex and a threeplex and a, you know, those I own, I'm not going to sell those back to the tenants. And then also both parks each had um, also coincidentally eight park owned units. So one of the parks I sold two of those units back to the tenants. One of them, I seller financed them on. Uh, the other one, they paid cash because ultimately I want to just own the land. And, uh, you know, the maintenance and repair um, when, before I bought this one particular park had all been on the park owned units. And so when a tenant takes ownership of a, of a property, not only are they responsible for the upkeep of that unit because they own it, they want it. They want to upkeep it. They want to take care of it because, again, they own it. So they have some pride of ownership, and they're willing to keep the place, keep the place a lot nicer because it's theirs. So, do you raise rents eventually, or how, uh, how do you, uh, like, you know, if you want to scale, or what do you say um, you want to upgrade things, let's say, sure. and uh, do you raise the rents, and how do you equate that? Yeah, I'll do small rent increases. Um, you know, most of that's handled by my property manager, but we have conversations around it. You know, in, in Oregon, where I am, they have implemented some rent control stuff. 
okay. um, which in some ways, it hasn't been a huge impact on my portfolio. Uh, you know, but in, in the city in Portland, they were, they were, you know, doing these, this rent control stuff. And before it kicked in, a lot of these owners were just, you know, bringing the rent way up. So it almost had this reverse effect that, that they were hoping for. Um, you know, that being said, it's important to, to do steady increases because if you get too far behind market rent, you won't be able to eventually catch up. I never jack the rent up crazy on the tenants. Like I want them, you know, if I have a good tenant and then they're paying rent and they're, you know, they're a good tenant, it, I'd rather keep them in, I'd rather keep them in there. It's, uh, you know, turnover and vacancy is very costly. Uh, you know, with the mobile home parks, both parks that I bought, the rents hadn't been, been increased in four and a half and five years. So they were grossly under rented. So I did a very small increase and started building back utilities, which was still a very low impact on the tenants spread out over, you know, however many, all those units. Um, but it, it made the park operate nicer, it put more money in back into my pocket, which also allowed me to put more money into the park to, to do some of those improvements at the park that the park needed. So it's a true win-win both my parks, the rents are still below, below market rent, but it's going to be a slow, a slow increase over the next couple of years just to, so it doesn't impact the tenants um, severely. So with this COVID and all, did it affect a lot with the renters and everything or how was the market? Yeah, it's a good question because the, you know, I know a stat came out early in March that, you know, 30% of tenants didn't pay rent. You know, I, I have friends all over the country, all over the world, really in the real estate uh, investment business. And, you know, everyone I talked to, you know, in March, including myself, it was all at like 90%, 95%, 98%, 100% percent collection same thing in May, same thing in June, but you know, the stimulus money started kicking in. You had, um, you know, unemployment kicking in. So that income was coming. The only tenants that I had that didn't pay were tenants that were already behind anyway, unrelated to, unrelated to COVID. The, the only other impact I'm seeing, I have a couple units that are on camp on the college campus. And, uh, usually those are pre-leased early in, um, like March for the, for the fall. And, they weren't pre-leased. So they're, they're getting rented now. Um, but that's really been the only impact because the college, uh, the, the college students aren't necessarily physically coming back to class. And so those units have taken a little longer to fill. Uh, but for the most part, people need a place to live. They're staying in their home. Uh, you know, if, if they're not paying rent, ultimately they're going to have to pay it at some time. And, and so the conversation I had with my manager was, Hey, if the tenants can't pay, like they're going to be in a lot worse position six months down the road if all of a sudden they owe six months worth of rent. So most tenants have been great. There is some assistance out there for tenants that, that truly can't pay and the property manager has helped facilitate that really well. That's nice. And with the fires and everything now, is it in your area or it's, I see. Oh yeah. We got like, like 30 minutes, 30 minutes that way, 30 okay. minutes East of me, we got, we have fires, they're evacuating. Um, and we had another small one about 20 minutes in the west. And so, uh, yeah, I shut, that, I shut that window behind me, but it's, it's smoky. And, uh, yeah, you know, people are evacuating in almost every, every direction. So, yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so what kind of exit strategies you take in, your re uh, in the investments? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think exit so much as, um, you know, I don't put myself in a position that I necessarily have to exit. So, uh, even though I have sold property and I'm in the process of selling some of those early purchases, uh, you know, it's always been cash flow first. And I wasn't buying up for appreciation. I wasn't buying for the upside. I love buying properties that have that upside potential. Um, but it's cash flow first. Cash flow is what allowed me to, you know, to live off of the, the real estate investments. And so, you know, going in, you know, uh, on to the, to the future, and to scale, yeah, I may sell some of my lower producing properties and in exchange into some, some larger things. Uh, but I'm also okay if I don't sell any of my properties. Yeah. And it's, it's been strategic to, you know, I don't, need, I don't need to sell them and I don't want to be in a position where I have to sell them for the deal to make sense. Okay. And you, you would do seller financing too, I guess, right? In case needed. Maybe. That, you know, that, it was one of the best questions. Like I had... I was asked this question. I'd been talking about seller financing for so long and I was at this local event and this woman raised her hand and I'd never been asked it before. And she goes, Hey, I was wondering if you had a duplex that you uh, want to sell me and if you had seller finance it to me. <laughs> and I told her no, but I said, keep asking me. She never emailed me. I gave her my email, never emailed me. I said, email me every month. 
but I said this to someone else, you know, I have a guy that emails me every single month asking me if I have a property to sell or finance because that could be a great exit strategy for me. So, you know, down the road and as I start paying a lot of these properties off, I may not want to exchange. I may be traveling the world and, and want just the income. And so I may be on the other end of that where seller financing my properties uh, would make sense. Or, you know, my children, maybe seller financing the properties to, to them. I don't want to just hand it over and say, here you go, good luck. I want them to, if they're interested, to, you know, to learn to learn as well. Because I think that's, that's more important than uh, the asset itself is, is understanding how to, to operate it and, and run the business. So uh, yeah, we'll see. It, it's, it's very possible. And that's a very good point. Yeah. You can hand it, hand over to the children, the, the paper, right. Instead of just hanging over to the, uh, the property. Yeah. That's yeah. very true. Yeah. We were actually on a walk one day and they asked me if I'd sell or finance them uh, this one particular house, but the, the terms were out, the terms that they offered and my kids are 10 and 12. They offered me such outrageous terms. Um, <laughs> It wasn't no, they wanted no money down, which was great. I appreciate that because I've done a lot of no money down deals. Um, but they were like, we want, a, it was a single family home. They're like, we want a thousand dollars a month cash flow. Um, and I was like, I, I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know if these terms are going to work. They're, it's good for you. It's got to be win win. So we'll see. It, it's, it's definitely a possibility. Sure. And what are the suggestions you would give to the newer generations who want to get into real estate? Where, where can they start? Yeah, I think it's more important to just start than where to start. You know, it's, there's so many asset classes within real estate, right? Like there's people that are kicking ass in single family and multifamily and self-storage uh, and development. And I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of ways to do it. I think, I think if you want it bad enough, you'll find a way, you know, for me, you know, part of the story that I don't think I share enough is I lived very, very frugally for a lot of years. I mean, even when I had a handful of houses or a couple handful of houses, I didn't go out and buy all these fancy things. Like I was putting my money back into to real estate, back into the deal, you know? And so, you know, house hacking it, like being, are you willing to rent out two of the rooms? If you're a, a single guy or girl, are you willing to, you know, share a house? Are you willing to do that for several years, whatever it takes to kind of build up that cash flow and lower your expenses? Because that goes a long ways. I mean, it's, it's easy to look at, you know, there's people doing it and this, all these fancy and fun things they're doing, but, like I get to live the life I live today because of those sacrifices I made early on. I didn't care that my friends were driving nice cars. Then I was driving $600 cars, a thousand dollar car because I was focused on building wealth. It's been, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's the thing, like you make those sacrifices, you're willing to live like no other for, you know, a decade. You can do a lot of positive damage in a 10 year period in the real estate world. Uh, if you're willing to make those sacrifices and 10 years from today, wake up and be like, oh my gosh, I've, I've created something that's pretty neat and I can live off of this. You know, it's just, it's how much are you willing to sacrifice early on? How, how dedicated, you know, are you to, to financial freedom? And, and then part of that is you can't care what other people think. Like, I, I just didn't care what other people thought early on, you know, like it's, uh, I was dead set on, on I'm going to build a real estate portfolio and that's how I'm going to become financially free. And a lot of people said, yeah, you're an idiot or how, and that seems scary and that seems risky. And it was, you know, you just find a way, you just learn as you go. On the same note, a new person want to buy a house and rent part of it, right? Let's say they purchase a duplex or triplex. Is that considered as a primary residence or an investment? He's staying in one and rent the other. Uh, if they go to the bank and one property, right? Yep. So do they consider that as a primary or a investment? Yeah. Most banks, they'll consider a one to four. You can go get an FHA loan typically for three and a half percent down. Even for one the to family? Yep. One to four units. Wow. If you're, if you live in it for a year, you have to intend to live in it for a year. So, you know, people say, Hey, they want a duplex they want, or, you know, they're going to house hack, buy a four unit place, live in one unit, better yet live in one room rent out the other rooms in your unit and you have three rentals outside of that. Super. You know, you can, you can live for, you can live for free. So with that, I finished the base questions. I have a few sure. rapid questions, I would say. Sure. sure. <laughs> so best habit you're proud of. Best habit I'm proud of. Mm -hmm. Taking action. That's good. What is the first thing you do in the morning? First thing I do in the morning, drink water and meditate. Beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Uh, best app or tool you use on a daily basis? Gosh, best app or tool I use? Um, gosh, I used to have, I, 
years ago, I would have said I had a mortgage calculator on there. Um, I don't use that as much. Um, I don't know. I'm really active on Instagram. So that's kind of my go-to app, honestly. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful. It's just, it's how no, I. That, that's the best way to reach people. You have yeah, to show yeah. up and that's, that, that's how it, it works for sure. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And best book, blog, or podcast you recommend? Oh gosh. Uh, I mean, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, for sure. You yeah. know, cha- you know, it, it, huge impact on my life. A lot of the books in, in that, in that series have been very impactful, especially early on. Um, but gosh, the compound effect has been, is, is a great book. Uh, you know, think and grow rich, how to win friends and influence people. Uh, you know, all great books. Um, podcasts. I, I listen to a lot of the real estate podcasts, uh, bigger pockets, of course. I think that's a great, uh, great resource that, that wasn't something that, that existed when I started, but you get so many different guests on there that, that have different stories and they're all doing it a different way. And so, you know, you find something that, that you connect to or makes sense and a lot of ideas out there. So, you know, bigger box is a great one. Sure. Name three most important things to you. The most important things, my family, my health, and my happiness. Success I mean, means to you. Yeah. Success to me means living life on your terms, living life that, uh, that you desire and that you design the way that you want to. Any quote you live by or think often? Time freedom. I think about how things affect my time. I was going to say, as far as, as, far as a, a quote, I have one on my arm that my dad used to tell me. Um, it's be who you is, not who you isn't. If you is who you isn't, you isn't who you is. And it's beautiful. just a way of saying be yourself. Yeah, beautiful. That's, that's very true. What do you get inspired by every day? Gosh, my family um, and, then, and other people. I really enjoy watching other people have success. I love seeing you know, people transform themselves, whether it's financially, uh, whether it's uh, emotionally, they go from uh, you know, being sad and depressed to, to finding joy in the world. Um, whether it's, you know, health related, you know, like when someone tells me, man, I just lost a hundred pounds this last year, you know, like stuff like that. That's, I love that kind of stuff. When people just take charge of their life and they go out there and they kick ass. One last final question. Life is fill it up. Life is what you make of it. All right. Gabriel, thank you so much. You shared a lot of information, a great story, the success story. We can learn a lot of things from you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Appreciate it.